Right. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on this very beautiful sunny day. We realize we're competing with like amazing Boston weather. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the BU Office of Research and our Vice President and Associate Provost of Research, Gloria Waters, for hosting us today. My name is Jennifer Grotsky. I am BU's Vice President for Federal Relations. Our office is in Washington, D.C., and we advocate for the university's priorities on Capitol Hill and with the administration. And one of the roles that we play is connecting policymakers with BU faculty and students. And the lawmakers that we work with are really eager to learn from experts such as yourselves, but they often don't know how to find you or engage with you. Um, and similarly, we often hear from faculty and occasionally students um, who would like to share their expertise with members of Congress or other federal officials, but they're not really sure how to do it. So I am very delighted uh, today to welcome Dr. Adam Levine of Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Levine is an Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. He is also the President and Co-Founder of Research for Impact, a nonprofit devoted to creating collaborative relationships between stakeholders, such as policymakers and scientists. And I first had the good fortune to meet Adam when he spoke on a panel at the National Academy of Sciences last year. And I will say I was really intrigued by his scholarly and evidence-based approach to the important work of bringing people with diverse sets of expertise together. I am very pleased he could be with us today. He has a wealth of knowledge to share with us. He's also promised to leave a lot of time for your specific questions. So I'll ask you now to be thinking about what you wanna ask him. I'll add that today's session is being recorded and he's gonna share his slides. So you can uh, review this again and, and take a look at the talk in the future or share it with other folks who aren't here today. And with that, the floor is yours, Dr. Levine. All right. Well, thank you so much um, and uh, grab this. Um, and thank you everybody so much for, for um, being here today. I am thrilled to be here um, and uh, I'm gonna do my best to be extra interesting because I know what I'm competing against. Um, and we're gonna keep, we, we debated, do we keep the blinds open or not? But we're gonna keep them open, um, but I'm gonna do my best to sort of like get your like eyes focused here, not over there. So we're gonna see, we'll see how we do. Um, I am gonna sort of, I figured I would talk for like about 25 minutes or so. Um, and then um, the rest of the time is for Q and A, but also I should say like, if you have a question like in the middle of something I say, like, you know, like, please raise your hand. Like, you know, please do not like be shy about that at all. I realize the sort of like the room is sort of set up in such a way that like, you know, it's not, you know, we're not around a circle or anything like that, but I really wanna sort of encourage you to ask questions at any time. So, um, so with that said, um, the, so the title of this talk is Policymakers Unmet Desire for Science, um, and I do really want to sort of um, give a shout out to the Reed Allen Foundation as well as the William T. Grant, William T. Grant Foundation um, for very generous funding that supports a lot of this work. Um, and um, with that said, here we go. Um, so uh, policy engagement um, is a term that I'm guessing many people in the room are very familiar with. It's a term that I know is very increasingly common um, at many universities, um, including sort of Johns Hopkins, including, as I'm told, Boston University. Um, and when people think about sort of policy engagement, um, the question becomes like, you know, what do we mean? Um, and so I think sort of some of the most common and visible forms that people often sort of talk about, at least that I see them talking about, um, one is dissemination. And so where you sort of like you've done research and you're disseminating it out to the world, um, that might take the form of op-eds, that might take the form of white papers, that might take the form of um, engaging in social media. Okay. Um, then there's what I would call sort of collaborative relationships that are oriented towards formal collaboration. And when I use the term formal collaboration, what I mean is sort of like people working together where there is um, a degree of interdependence, so shared ownership, decision-making authority, and accountability. Um, and what that might look like, the kind of forms that that might take might be, say, being on part of a task force, being part of a committee, um, engaging in some sort of consulting arrangement, uh, maybe engaging in a research partner. Okay, so there's a number of different formats like that. Um, and so there's another um, less, um, both less resource intensive, but also less visible form, which is really largely what I wanna to talk to you about today, um, which I think is really important and, um, and, is, and, and really impactful, um, but sort of often less, less talked about, which is collaborative relationships that are oriented towards informal collaboration, knowledge exchange, um, where there's not necessarily um, a high degree of interdependence, but there is um, information that's being shared um, and a sort of an orientation towards expanded understanding of a problem that people care about. Okay. So um, 
a couple of just like a little bit of sort of like essentially sort of throat clearing really, um, which is that uh, so collaborative relationships between researchers and policymakers um, in general are extremely vital for both uh, disseminating research um, and also for forming evidence based policy. And there's a lot of a lot of the citations that are up there. Um, I'm happy to sort of talk more about any individual citation that people sort of like see a name up there like, wait a minute, I've heard of that before. Um, but anyway, but largely that's sort of like what this research collectively finds um, and what it also finds. Um, is that some policymakers regularly engage with researchers. And there really is, I'll just sort of pause for a second and just say, if you aren't sort of familiar with it, because a lot of people often aren't, like there's a whole body of research that often goes by the name um, Use of Research Evidence, URE. Uh, the William T. Grant Foundation is sort of one of the kind of main foundations that funds this kind of work. Um, so they have a whole program area called Use of Research Evidence. Um, and that's really what a lot of these kinds of citations really come out of. Um, and so, and they'll do things like they'll ask, for example, policymakers about the ways in which they in, interact with researchers and how they use research or how they don't use research and, and, um, and things like that. Okay. Um, so anyway, so some policymakers regularly engage with, with researchers. The question though, that I was interested in that really motivates um, what I'm going to present to you today is a slightly different question, which is, do policymakers have the collaborative relationships that they want to be having with researchers? So you sort of see how, right, like the thing, the second bullet point up there is more of like a kind of like kind of uh, speaks to and a lot of that research or speaks to like more of the supply side, what are researchers doing. But this last question is sort of like, you know, like, what is the demand and to what extent are researchers, um, uh, um, to what extent rather, like, is there a sort of demand that is sort of that might potentially sort of be unmet. And that's this term that I use called unmet desire. Um, and I'm going to use that basically throughout the talk. Okay. So um, in order to investigate that, so that's really like the core like, you know, question that I'm sort of um, after here. Um, what I'm gonna do is I wanna um, present a survey of local policymakers. Now the initial motivation for this survey of local policymakers, um, and the data for this, by the way, is like super cool. I'm just like, that's like a kind of like for, um, foreshadowing. Um, the like initial motivation for even doing this in the first place is um, I'll think back to like March of 2020, um, the world was sort of like shutting down in the United States and, and people were sort of, you know, there's a lot of like work from home that was starting for many, not everybody, but for a lot of people. Um, and um, a lot of policymakers, especially local policymakers who are very much at the front lines of sort of public health in many, many ways, um, they were facing unprecedented challenges. And so me and a colleague of mine kind of knew that. Um, and, you know, we basically start just start reaching out to policymakers, local policymakers, um, uh, mostly at the county level. And we sort of started asking them, like, you know, are there any like policy kind of in light of what's happening? Are there any policy challenges that you're facing in which like you think research would be helpful? And you know, first of all, like the initial response, as you could probably imagine, was kind of like, wait, who are you? <laughs> like, what are you doing? I was um I, I was on faculty at Cornell at the time, so in upstate New York, and so we were doing this for like local policymakers throughout in counties throughout upstate New York. Anyway, and so that was like, the, so we had to kind of get over that like hump a little bit of like, you know, like what's going on here. Um, but, you know, but then like, you know, people actually responded and they said things. I mean, you know, I'm talking about like, you know, county legislators and talking about like county executives, you know, and they would like tell us things. It would be like, yeah, you know, I need to find some way of like providing childcare for first responders. Now the childcare centers are closed. I have residents in more rural areas in my counties and we need to provide mobile services to them. You know, I need to do, I'm here something, right? Like as somebody who's like a political scientist by training, we do surveys like, you know, it's going out of style. But like, if you've never done a survey, we had a county legislator was like, we need to survey our town supervisors to even get an understanding, like, like what are their needs? And I'm like, I've never done a survey. Like what, you know, what, like, what does that consist of? What are the best practices? What do I need to keep in mind? Things like that. So anyway, so that was our, so we had these experiences. That was in the spring of 2020. At the time, it was fairly informal between me and, and, and my colleague, Elizabeth Day. Um, and basically all we did was essentially we just kind of like they would ask us these questions we said okay well you know we can tell you this right now and then let's get back to you on this other stuff or like with the survey one we actually said well okay we'll just do a you know a first draft for you and we'll send it to you and stuff anyway so that's what happened and so the question sort of was like all right like you know was this just kind of like a weird fluke because it was march and april of 2020 or is there some sort of like you know is this just the tip of the iceberg is there some sort of broader sense of like unmet desire and like, what might it look like? And so that's what motivated this survey. So, all right, so this was, so there, here's the data. So there's this organization called Civic Pulse. It was started by a couple of political scientists. Um, and, um, it, um, and they have a national sample of local policymakers. 
Um, it's like it's it's like totally sort of like unheard of data. Uh, but they've kind of like they've collected it, and you can basically like request um, uh, to like you know have like um, to 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 um, survey people that are part of their panel. And so um, so anyway, so that's that's the organization Civic Pulse. Um, and so what this focuses on is um, local policymakers, and part of the reason at the time was sort of the sense that like local policymakers like might have unmet desire for science first of all, um, because remember too, and I guess like maybe this is like kind of obvious, but like just to sort of maybe state the obvious, like a lot of local policymakers, maybe not like folks like say in City Hall of a, of a large city like Boston, although maybe yes too, I don't really know, but like, but you know, certainly sort of like county legislators, especially in some of the smaller counties, like, you know, like researchers don't reach out to them in the way that people go to Capitol Hill. <laughs> like it just, you know, like that just doesn't happen, right? Or go to like Annapolis, you know, in there, you know, and it just doesn't happen as much. So the question was sort of like, but also at the same time, you know, they're responsible for trillions of dollars of spending every year collectively. And especially, as, you know, when we're talking about sort of public health crises, they are very much on the front lines of public health. Okay. So anyway, so focusing on them because they're important. Um, then the question was, you know, we talk about sort of collaborative relationships, right? The question is sort of like collaborative relationships with who? <laughs> and so, um, so all right, we're going to focus on local policymakers, but then we also said, all right, let's focus on local researchers. And part of the reason for that is because I put up there, right, is um, because the collaborative relationships with local researchers. So I'm thinking about basically like, you know, say county legislators throughout upstate New York, it's just an example, and say folks are at the, um, the SUNY campuses, the State University of New York campuses that, are dot, that dot the entire state of New York. Like that would be one example, uh, but one example of many, um, because this is like a national sample. Um, and so anyway, so those kinds of collaborative relationships are highly doable. And so that was sort of like the kind of motivation here. We're going we're gonna to focus on this set of people who are really important, and we're going to focus on a potential collaborative relationship with another set of people that are also important and like where it's like really doable. Okay, um, or potentially doable. All right. So the end here is 541. This was in the spring of 2021. Of course, yes, very much still the COVID pandemic. Um, not quite like the, you know, a uh, different part of the pandemic uh, than in spring of 2020. Um, and I just, if I'm happy to say more about this, if anybody's interested, there are survey weights here to increase sample representativeness, because as you can probably imagine, getting legislators to respond, you know, some are easier than others. <laughs> um, just gotta leave it at that. Um, okay, so, um, so what I want to do, actually, before I put that up there, um, I want to do what I want to do is I want to present to you some of the results from this survey. Okay. Um, and these are going to be figures that are taken from a paper. Um, there's a paper. If you actually like Google uh, my name, Adam Levine, um, and Unmet Desire, if you just Google Adam Levine, trust me, I don't come up. Um, but if you Google Adam Levine and Unmet Desire, the paper will come up and it's publicly available. Um, but anyway, so the, the figures are going to come from that. Okay. Um, actually, maybe what I'll do before I do that, though, is just pause for a second. Does anybody have any, any questions? Anything? Yes. Referring to county legislators, you mean state legislators that are from individual counties? Uh, no, I mean legislators in the county. County. Yep. County and actually municipal too. So the the sample is actually a combination. What Civic Pulse has done is they take it county and municipal, and they so it's everybody at the local um, or almost everybody at the local level. Yeah, town meeting or the township. Oh, got it. Uh, yes, um, so it is true that once you start talking about local politics, like things are very different, but the, but the sample will include certainly has people from Massachusetts and certainly includes both municipal and county level governments. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what's your name, by the way? You should be asking. Michael. Wait, what's your name? My name is Allison. Allison. Just policymakers. Yep. Thank you for asking. And you'll see that with the questions. So the questions are going to be about their unmet desire to for collaborative relationships with local researchers. Yeah. Anybody else? Question? Is anyone to like express their enthusiasm for like what we're about to see? <laughs> there you go. There. I love. See, look at that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Awesome. Let's do it. Um, okay, so here's um, figure one. So this is a questionnaire is which stakeholders are so part of the survey asked about um, what kinds of stakeholders, um, public stakeholders, um, these uh, local uh, policymakers um, already interact with, how frequently do they interact with different kinds of folks. And so the more uh, green meat that there is, um, that means that they interact with them more frequently. 
uh, the more red means that they interact with them less frequently. Um, and I realize there's kind of a lot up there, um, but let me just sort of, if you look on the left hand side, you see like we asked about different kinds of folks. And you know, these meant to sort of kind of run the gamut of the kinds of people um, that a local legislator or even a you know, federal legislator might, might interact with. Um, and so other government officials in your county, grassroots community leaders, business leaders, government officials outside the county, staff, national organizations, um, national state organizations, um, lobbyists, researchers. And then at the bottom, you see researchers at colleges and universities outside your region. And then researchers at colleges and universities within your region. So you can think about sort of non-local and local. Um, if you look up at the top, what you see is like, you know, perhaps not surprising, the people they interact with the most frequently are government um, officials in their county or grassroots community leaders and business leaders. Okay, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe surprising, maybe not surprising. Um, however, if you look at the bottom, researchers at colleges and universities in their region. So 75%, that's the red, 75% said that they had never interacted with them over the past year, like not once. If we say, all right, well, fine, maybe what they're doing is they're all interacting with the Bloomberg Cities Initiative, okay, or, or whatever, right? And so, like, all right, so let's, like, expand it to researchers at colleges and universities outside their region. All right, you know, now we're about, like, 70% who have said that they've never had any interaction whatsoever over the past year. And so I think that, like, you know, um, uh, this is sort of, like, telling that, you know, this is sort of, this isn't happening right now. Now, of course, you might sort of say, well, okay, fine, it's not happening, but you know, so what, right? Like, I mean, it's just not happening. And, you know, maybe because maybe they say like, you know, I don't really need that. So there were other questions on the survey that more directly sort of tap into this sense of unmet desire. And I also want to sort of acknowledge that you might be sort of sitting there thinking like, you know, what exactly, like when you say unmet desire, like what do you mean exactly? So let me sort of give you examples of those questions. So here we asked, um, uh, how often, so the existing is basically what was on the previous slide. This has been differently, but it's basically like what was on the previous slide, okay? So you see sort of like all the way on the left-hand side, this is the 75% that said that I had over the past year, no interaction whatsoever um, with, local, uh, with local researchers, okay? Uh, and so that's, so that's the dark green. So over the past year, how much have you interacted with local researchers? Then the light green was, well, but looking ahead to the next year, do you want more than what you currently have, the same or less? And what you see is that basically about almost 60% said that they want more than what they currently have. And so when I sort of use the term unmet desire, one of the ways I'm thinking about it is basically this, right? And of course, this is gonna include a number, you know, mo most of the people there have none right now, just given the size of the dark green bar. Um, but in general, like when I use the term unmet desire, part of what I'm looking at is basically this, the approximately 60% of respondents who said, I want more interact, more collaborative relationships, more interaction um, with local researchers than what I currently have. So there's, here's another way of, of measuring that, um, which is, um, so now we ask like, how often over the past year have you been contacted by um, a researcher at a local college or university, okay? Um, and so what you see on the uh, left-hand side, is that approximately 80% said that they had not been contacted at all by anybody at a local uh, uh, college or, or university. And I should say, by the way, you know, yeah, and almost everybody, I mean, colleges, we have colleges and universities all over the place in this country. So almost everybody has one that is like kind of within the region. We did actually have a question on there about like, you know, oh, do you like, do you have one in your region? And if you take out the few people who said no, I mean, the pattern is roughly the same. Um, and stuff. And so anyway, but so yeah, so about 80% said, no, 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 I've never been contacted by anybody in my local university. Um, and then, but are you open to it? So are you open to um, having somebody at the, uh, at the local college or university reach out to you unprompted to talk about research related to policy challenges you're facing? And that was actually precisely how the question was worded. So talk about research related to policy challenges that you're facing. And what you see is that approximately, um, just slightly, it's slightly be uh, below that, but anyway, approximately 80% said yes. So again, when I use the term unmet desire, in part I'm sort of saying that, that what was on the previous slide, that like approximately 57% who said that they want more um, interaction over the, the coming year than what they've had already. And then I'm also looking at this um, bar right here that say, yeah, are you kidding? I would be more than happy to have 80% of people, um, uh, or sorry, 8% of people rather saying, I'd be more than happy to have local uh, researchers reach out to me. Now, it is absolutely fair. I can tell, I can just tell by like the look on your face. So what you're thinking is, well, okay, fine. 
These are just survey responses. You know, cheap talk. Yeah, fair enough. It is, I mean, so we had another question um, that came after this, um, which asked like, oh, it was open-ended. And it was like, all right, well, what kinds of policy challenges do you want to talk about? You know? And, um, and so the, and the answers were, you know, were extremely varied. So again, I want to remind you, this was the spring of 2021. The answers were basically like all over the place. And what I mean by all over the place is that like, they really like reflected the rich diversity of local political agendas, right? So, you know, some of the kinds of issues that were at the top of like, like kind of like national level politics at the time, like for example, like fights over mask mandates, like almost nobody said anything about that. The kinds of things that they talked about were things like local environmental issues, land use issues, some education stuff, but not critical race theory. Again, thinking back to like, you know, what was happening at the national level in the spring of 2021, okay? Um, you know, so those kinds of things, which again, reflects the fact like those are the things that local um, policymakers that they're dealing with um, all the time. Um, okay. Question. Yes, um, please. What's your name? Rebecca. Rebecca. Yeah, so if, if you were to basically, um, it is not, um, it is not the case that these two overlap. Um, yeah, and so I don't, I don't have that on the slide, but thank you for asking. It is not the case. I mean, I think there's like a little bit, but like, it's not the case that the majority of people were like, yeah, you know, that asshole, pardon my French, is being recorded, um, contacted me and like, you know, I don't need this. <laughs> um, but there, there was a little bit, I mean, you know, which I mean, you know, that's, that is the way, that's the way the world works, you know. Um, some interactions go well and some don't. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I don't actually, I know we didn't ask specifically about the folks who had been contacted, what exactly happened, but, you know. Um, but so anyway, so of the, um, so with that open-ended response, we had about um, up just under 40%. It was like, I'm trying to actually remember the exact number, but it was just under 40% of respondents um, who, who volunteered a response, okay? And so I think that it's reasonable to sort of say, so look, was it, you know, 80%? No. Was it 57%? No. But it was about 40% who basically like took the time in an open-ended question to tell us about an actual policy challenge that they would want to talk about. And I'll also just say that we got very few open-ended responses that basically told us like that, that like very few people who took the opportunity to criticize like research in our like open-ended text box. Okay. I mean, for the most part, the kinds of responses we got were like, you know, real policy issues, which again really reflected the varied um, and textured nature of local political agendas. Okay, so um I, a lot of the research I do um, is on sort of like I, in general, I sort of do research on the science of collaboration, but I also sort of a lot of research I do sort of, you know, aims to have this kind of actionable element to it. And so in the process of doing the survey, I'm also thinking to myself, you know, um, like, what do we need to learn? Sorry, hit that by accident. What do we need to learn um, in order to actually sort of take these results? Like we do research. What do we need to learn to take these results and then actually sort of turn them into action, right? And so one of the things that I'm really interested in is, um, you know, how it is like that, that people who are strangers like relate to each other. Because if you think about it, right, like when we talk about sort of like researchers and policymakers interacting for the first time, you know, like when Jennifer interacts with policymakers, like she knows them already and they know her, right? And so there's already like this sense of like, I know how to relate to you. Okay, but like, you know, if I reach out to like, you know, a random legislator, like was what we were doing in March of 2020, like I'm a stranger and they are strangers to me. And there's all sorts of like ways in which like we can be, and this is just a more general point, we can be uncertain about how to relate to strangers. And so one of the things I'm really interested in is sort of unpacking essentially what I call relationality, which is essentially where how do we relate to others? How do they relate to us? But then even kind of more so digging a little bit deeper, like what kinds of things of what might we be uncertain about when interacting with strangers, okay? So that's where this comes from. So this comes from basically trying to say, all right, like, you know, thinking about like a researcher, like reaching out to a policymaker, they've never interacted before, okay? Like what should that researcher potentially be keeping in mind? What should that researcher be cognizant of? What kinds of hesitations might the policymaker have about interacting with the researcher? So this was um, a series of closed-ended questions. So all of this text appeared on the survey. So I, I, like, I wrote all this, okay? And so, um, so this, it wasn't open-ended responses. Um, and so we gave them a list and we asked basically like, you know, do you have any of these um, concerns about interacting with, with um, researchers at colleges and universities in your region? And we just said, you know, just click yes or no. 
And so what you see, and so what these percentages are, so the 47.5, 34.1, et cetera, are basically the percentage of respondents who said, yes, I would be concerned about this, okay? And so what you see is that sort of, first of all, like, look, a majority of people um, like did not say any of these things. I'm just gonna like, you know, start with that, right? Um, so that, that's something, okay? Um, and um, we, we had like, I mean, you know, and I, I'm using survey weights here to increase sample representativeness. We had Democrats and Republicans, uh, we had men and women. I mean, you know, we had like, you know, a, a good deal of um, uh, diversity along several lines, okay, across this national sample. Um, a majority did not say any of these things, okay? But having said that, of course, if you look at the top, you sort of say, all right, well, I might be really worried about them pushing a political agenda. Um, okay. Right below that is I'm worried about them maybe not having practical information. Um, and, and, and I think that that's something really to sort of keep in mind. And then if you sort of look at the three, the next three, which are all roughly around the same, you had approximately one fifth of respondents um, of these policymakers who said they might not have trustworthy information. They may not have domain specific expertise. It is worth noting, by the way, how there's obviously a distinction being made between having domain specific expertise and having practical information. It's not enough to say, oh, I study land use policy. That is different from saying I have practical information that can help you craft land use policy, you know, because you have to figure out like how to zone this like new like commercial district or, you know, whatever it is, right? Like that's, you know, it's a different thing. Okay. Anyway, and then they may not value my knowledge and experience as a policymaker. Um, the last one, I'll also say, um, and I'm happy to talk more about this in Q&A, but like um, in between doing that initial thing in March of 2020 and fielding this survey, which was a year later, I did a lot of interviews um, with local policymakers. And so some of these things, actually like all of these things came out of these interviews, basically. Like, that's, that's how I even like came up with the list. Um, and, one, and what's interesting about that is that like um, the policymakers have these stories about sort of what it looked like when researchers did some of this stuff. So the, like, they may not value my knowledge and experience as a policymaker. So you have these like po lo local policymakers who sort of talk about basically researchers who sort of come into these meetings and they just sort of like, like spew information. <laughs> and then it's sort of like, there's like mic drop and they leave. And this idea that like, you might sort of ask the policymakers, you know, tell me about like, you know, the, the area where you, you know, tell me about your county, tell me about your town, tell me about your city, you know, tell me about like the history of what's going on there. You know, and like the, the idea that like you might want to sort of, and I, and I know this sort of sounds obvious, I think, after the fact, but the idea that the researcher might come in and like seem to learn a lot about sort of the current issues, current challenges, um, changes over time, all that kind of stuff before sharing information and then share it and then ask, what do you think about that? Does that resonate with you? Does this make sense? Do you think did part of it like resonate more than others? And like anyway, engage in that back and forth. You know, there was a sense that, like, you know, the, the concern among 17.8% of respondents that that might not happen. Okay. So let me um, pretty much like, uh, oh, yeah, 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 totally. Sorry, what's your name? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, so I didn't do that. That's a great question. No, I didn't. Um, and um, what's your name? Debbie. Debbie. Um, that's my mom's name. Um, and um, uh, so, no, I didn't do that. And um, but uh, the if you look at like so, the eighty percent who said that they had had no contacts. So that's the majority. The results are more or less the same. Um, but um, I did not do it for the 50, for the sixty percent from a couple slides ago. Yeah, um, I'll have to get back to it. Um, so, so, okay, so, so I want to just like highlight a few takeaways. So the obvious like takeaway, just like immediate to the data, right, is that there's uh, what I would argue, what I, and what I, what I argue to you this after, on this beautiful afternoon of ours, okay, is that there's substantial evidence of unmet desire for science among local policymakers. That's kind of the most immediate response. And so I should also say that the patterns, uh, I, I put this up here because a, a common question people ask about the patterns do remain regardless of partisanship, gender, and age. Now, the one caveat to that is that the researchers will push a political agenda. That is definitely more Republicans are way more concerned about that than Democrats. That's like the one caveat to that. But everything else I, I showed you, and in particular, the unmet desire stuff applies regardless of that. All right. Um, 
Also reasonable evidence, it's not just cheap talk. And that's, again, comes back to those open-ended responses. You know, I think for some people, it totally might be cheap talk. It's also the case that like when 80% of like policymakers say, oh yes, I would totally welcome an, uh, somebody to reach out. You know, that doesn't mean that like, if I reach out tomorrow, that like 80% to all of them, all 541 of them, the 80% are gonna respond immediately. <laughs> I have a story about that. Um, so if somebody wants that, I'm, there's, I'm planting Q and A. Do you want to hear my story? Um, I because um, because what I have right now is a, a research project um, which is basically like meeting unmet desire. So this was just the survey, right? But like actually like doing the outreach and stuff. But anyway, okay. Um, so um, let me just so let me now step back a little bit. Just and this is like the final two minutes. Um, just stepping back to kind of like um, a, apart from the specific survey results. Okay, so some bigger picture. So first of all, I wanted to sort of like kind of emphasize that. New collaborative relationships often don't arise on their own. Um, and I mean, the, the, the existence of unmet desire as a phenomenon is basically evidence of that, okay? Um, and that's even when people would find them valuable. Because again, I think that's sort of, I mean, if you take these survey results and you sort of say, you know, that there's a grain of truth there, then that's basically what we're observing. They, they haven't, like people would find them valuable, they obviously aren't arising on their own. Um, the citation up there is, um, I'm being, um, I'm being optimistic. This is for a book that's coming out with Cambridge University Press called Collaborate Now, exclamation point. Um, and I'm being optimistic that it will be out in 2023. I might need to change that to 2024, but we'll see. Anyway, um, so for researchers, so some of you in the, I know the room is, 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 um, is diverse, right? So some of you I think are individual researchers um, or, and or aspiring researchers. I know there's some like students who are in the room. Um, and some of you, I, I believe, are organization leaders or institute leaders um, and BU leaders as well. Um, and so, you know, I think for researchers and for organizational leaders who seek policy engagement, I think one thing to think about, like a really great starting point, and I mean, I, hopefully this sort of is not a, like too much of a bridge given that you're already in this room, like, you know, this afternoon, is that like to simply like start by asking the question, like, do we have the collaborative relationships with policymakers that we want to have? Like just simply ask, like, like put that on the agenda. Um, and I think that, you know, um, I certainly can't speak to like the situation here, but I know in other universities where I'm presenting these kinds of results, you know, many people start saying like, you know, actually like to be honest, that isn't often on the agenda, um, you know, or, or at least not phrased in that way. Um, I think when you do that, I, so, and this is more, this is an argument I make to you and I encourage folks to push back if, if they, if you, if you want to. Um, which is, I think, doing that, you know, like thinking about ways to disseminate research, like again, through op eds, through white papers, and social media, that's great. That's totally important. Okay. Thinking about ways to engage in formal collaboration, that's great. That's totally important. I also think it's important to legitimize and elevate informal collaboration. And again, like, you know, when I, you know, I just come back to March of 2020, we reached out to these policymakers, these county policy, uh, local legislators, local policymakers, rather. Um, and, um, you know, and they were just kind of like, who are you? Like, what? Like, what? Because they're like, I, a researcher has never reached out to us. Like, what are you talking about? Right. And like, similarly, when I talk to a lot of researchers, you know, um, again, this is not a survey of researchers, but they're like, you know, the idea that I might reach out to a, like a policymaker like this, it's like, I've never, I've just never thought about it, you know? And so anyway, so I think it's sort of, you know, um, it's a way to do policy engagement that um, is maybe a little bit different. Um, okay. And then there's two approaches. One is to directly communicate. I'm going to say a little bit more about this in a second. And then organizational leaders. So I'm doing another session at three o'clock that I think some folks in the room, or sorry, four o'clock, that some folks in the room are going to be part of. And we're going to talk about unmet desire surveys um, and matchmaking as a way to sort of do that. Um, if anybody's interested, though, I've written a science policy memo, which is called that, that was published in the fall, um, which is on unmet desire surveys as a way to basically surface and then sort of try to meet unmet desire. Um, so, um, do you want me to smile? No, I can. All right, I got all the. I swear, I got all the parsley out of my teeth. All right. Um, okay. Um, from a really good lunch. But anyway, um, so that's another Q and A. If anybody wants to ask me about like where we went for lunch. Um, so um, let me just. But I'm gonna, I'm skipping over that because that's really the topic of the 4 p.m. session. Um, and I, I I just don't. I'm happy to talk about it here, but also. Um, I think it maybe is a little bit less relevant for most people in the room. Let me just sort of, I am gonna like, I wanna seed a couple of questions, which is for researchers who wanna reach out themselves, right? So this is this. Um, you know, I wanna just sort of like pose this. We don't have to talk about this, okay? I mean, like at all, but I wanna at least sort of pose it to say, you know, um, it's one thing for me to stand up here and say like, and try and argue to you that I think that there is this unmet desire. 
for collaborative relationships that policymakers, that at least local policymakers might have. Okay. Um, I think it is perfectly reasonable for you to sort of say, okay, fine, that's great. But like now, what? like, let's say I sort of say like, okay, we, th that sounds interesting. I haven't thought about that before, fine. Okay, but like, how should I actually reach out? So I'm happy to sort of talk about that. I'm also happy to talk about the question of like, once you've reached out and let's say somebody's responded, then how do you communicate with them? And that, that question comes up quite a bit as well. And then I will just, again, just, I'm putting this in here just more for completeness. This really is more of the 4 p.m. session, but you know, how should you design? Why should you design um, and field something like an unmet desire survey within um, decision make or, or, or targeting decision makers in your organization? So with that said, I'm gonna, that's the end. So this, now we go back to the original slide. I'm gonna leave this up just again, if folks are interested, but um, I really, um, how are we doing on time? So that's great. I mean, I really appreciate, it. I love the question so far. So I mean, I love the fact that like, you know, um, the, that this current portion, you know, uh, went longer, it was wonderful. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you all for being here. Um, hopefully I have, I, I, I am also really appreciating the eye contact. Like I don't see a lot of people looking out there, which is like amazing. Um, and so um, that's really fantastic. So thank you. Um, and I don't know, I'll just go basically from my like left to right, I think. What's your name? My name is Michael. Mike. I guess my question is, are there organizations that already exist that could provide information about the policy that we have to constantly with other organizations that we have? And make it more possible for these services to be that they have that Yeah, so that's a great question. So thank you for asking that. And so, um, so the answer is definitely yes. And it differs, like, I think for different areas and stuff. And, I, and my hunch is, and actually I'm guessing, like, Jennifer probably could speak to this quite a bit for, like, particularly for the local BU level. It's also the case, though, um, and, and I know that, like, you know, Johns Hopkins has a federal relations office. And then there's probably also, like, state level folks as well. So that would be different. Um, I don't know if there's Boston City folks. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. BU has, like, the full gamut. Um, it is also the case that like, and so this kind of comes at, okay, I'm gonna use your question, Michael, as an excuse to answer the, to speak to the first one about how should you reach out? Um, look, I'm not, nothing works 100% of the time because people are busy and other things are going on in people's lives and all that kind of stuff. I will say though, that like, you know, asking like, and especially maybe say like local legislators or maybe like staff of say state level folks, you know, because the state, once you're getting to state and federal, it can be hard to like reach them directly, but I mean, you can already reach local folks too. But, um, but, you know, asking the question, like, are you facing any policy challenges, you know, in which you think research might be helpful? Like I've had like quite a bit of success with that kind of outreach. And it's true that like, you know, and, and you know, at, at the very least, you might sort of say, oh, well, I don't really know what, the, what they're going to say and how am I going to respond to that, which is, that's a totally fair point. I mean, at least at that point, if you, you know, you start by with committee assignments and you sort of say, okay, well, look, you know, my area of expertise maybe is sort of like child and family policy. So I'm going to target folks on human services or, or, and I've had legislators who say this to me, like, why don't researchers ever come to our meetings? You know, and I, I um, like, you know, why don't they just come to like a, you know, a, 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 either a local legislative meeting or maybe a town meeting is sort of the better, like would be the better uh, um, format for, for here, you know, or like things like that. Um, and so anyway, because then what you do is, you, you know, you, you're learning a little bit more about the agenda and then you can sort of follow up based on that. Um, it is interesting, sorry, one other thing on this, right, which is sort of, you know, I think, um, you know, when I tell people about sort of like collaborative relationships, sometimes there's kind of this look of like, you know, okay, fine, isn't that kind of obvious? I build relationships in my life all the time, blah, blah, blah. It is interesting. And I'm not gonna say that like, this is true universally, of course, but like, I do think it's interesting that like, how many researchers I know who sort of like, they know what it's like to build relationships like in their lives, but yet with policymakers, there's a sense of like, well, all I'm gonna do is basically just try to like tell you about my research. Like that, that's what I'm doing, right? And like, when you talk to policymakers, they're sort of like, well, you know, like your research is not on my agenda right now. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe it is, but like a lot of times it isn't. And so the idea of like doing relationship building where you sort of ask them, like what policy challenges are you facing, you know, and things like, and starting that way. And of course, yes, over time, you know, it might be that at some point you're like the thing that you, you really care about and, and whatever, like comes on the agenda. And then like, you are the person to talk about it, but it may not be that way right away. And in fact, in surveys of policymakers, they'll talk about that. They'll be like, why don't researchers just ask us like, like, not always be trying to get something from us, you know. Anyway, um, uh, I think there was, I'll try to go over. No? Um, yeah. Um, first of all, I totally, that resonates with me a lot, the idea that faculty not asking questions first. <laughs> um, I have that experience a lot, so I, I appreciate you saying that. 
Um, in fact, the city of Austin, we just had a meeting with the faculty just wanted to share and say, you know, and stop and say, let's ask what the Green New Deal team is doing with their oh. you know, with their So that's, I think, feel like that's a big message for me. Um, but can you share some, like, a specific example or two about this being done well? Like, a, you know, anything like that. Just, just that kind of informal collaboration, how it started, how it works better. That's yeah, um, how much time do you have? <laughs> there were other hands though. Um, so let me, um, so I'll give, so one example of what's happening right now. So that, um, that, and this is like super, I mean, this is like literally like this week kind of happened, you know, and over the past couple of months. So um, so I have um, a project right now. So Elizabeth Day and I who did that initial outreach in March of 2020. Uh, Elizabeth Day is my fantastic and amazing colleague. We were both at the Cornell together in 2020. And now she's at University of Oregon and Cornell. She has two affiliations and I'm now at John Hopkins. But, um, um, but we we still we we still work together and um, it's great and um, so we have we have um, a project right now where we're actually trying to basically do some of this outreach and so one of the things that we're doing is like so um, is a project where um, we're as, as part of it rather um, I'm going to um, upstate New York counties and visiting like legislative legislative meetings um, or meetings of boards of supervisors it kind of differs depending on what county you're talking about. And, um, and actually sort of saying like, we have a new initiative, like, you know, to bring research related to child and family policy. So that's kind of the topic. Um, and if there's any child and family policy topic that your challenge that you're facing in your county right now, you know, get in touch with us. And then, you know, what we can do is, you know, we'll have a conversation like a needs assessment kind of thing, and then we'll pr produce a research brief. And that this is a project, it's fun this is funded by the William T. Grant Foundation and things like that. And so we're having, so now what's happening. So I've done, like I did 13 of these county visits um, in February, March and the beginning of April uh last week and um and so now we're having the legislators who and and also commissioners too so also executive branch folks who are responding and so what's happening is that so this collaborative relationship is basically them sort of responding to basically like you know kind of learning about this new initiative that that we have um and then saying like you know uh mental health is a big issue in our in our um, county or um uh, uh retaining um and recruiting um caseworkers is a really big challenge in our county or um, uh, um, uh, what's, oh, oh, um, uh, youth belongingness is a really big challenge in our county. Um, aging is a really big challenge in our county. Transportation, I mean, the whole long list. And so they sort, of, they, they, they sort of share that. And then we have a team of research assistants who are basically putting together kind of the latest research that, you know, to sort of make evidence-based, um, uh, we don't make policy recommendations, but we basically sort of say just kind of this is like an overview of what the evidence base says. And so that would be an example. There. So there's no like there's no interdependence between us. We're not sort of engaged in some sort of like research partnership where we're conducting new research together or anything like that. It's a fairly sort of short term thing. Um, and but, you know, it's meeting their needs. Um, and this is another example, right, where I think when I go to these, when I've gone to these legislative meetings and I stand up, I stand up, like, there's usually like an open floor part, like privilege of the floor, you raise your hand and the chairperson's like, hey, you, in the red sweater, you know, or whatever, and like you stand up and you know, you're at the podium, whatever, you get three minutes, and then three minutes, like somebody like yanks off and like, you know, then somebody else gets up, and like, you know, the typical response is just sort of like, you know, like, like, who, who are you? I mean, like, like nobody has ever come, like, what, what is this thing about? That's the, the most usual response is sort of like, what is this about? You know, and then it's kind of like, oh, I see. And of course, not everybody's interested. Of course not. But, you know, that's just one example of kind of initiating it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Adam. I'm thank you. John. I have a question for you about this unmet desire for science. Yeah. So I represent the Social Sciences at me. Oh. How contagious is that definition of science? In other words, my students are dissemination. Yeah. But when it comes to collaboration, I feel like certain Yeah. Because I imagine that it's a little bit suppressing, you know, headline you know, Yep. How would the sociologists working at comparative conscience say be able to engage or a historian? Or is this would you recommend this view not be taken by no 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 totally? Those are actually really great examples. I'm glad I'm glad you raised them because um uh, so I I'm a social scientist by training, my PhD is in political science. Um and um I um uh, and I was a sociology major in in college um, and so and an economics major, um, so I, I'm trying to run the gamut here, um, but um, to some extent. Um, and so um, yeah, so a couple of things on that. So um, so again, first of all, I think it's really important to, to be clear about what we mean by collaboration. So might they do formal collaboration where like essentially a you know a policymaker said we need an evaluation of the impact of this policy can. 
Maybe. Um, I mean, I think a lot of like um, arts and sciences folks don't necessarily see themselves as sort of doing policy evaluation. That'd be more like kind of public policy school, typically. I mean, you know, of course, there's big, wide variation. And so that may or may not kind of be a good fit. But like the kind of, if we're talking about the informal collaboration, which is just like the kind of the knowledge exchange that's happening, I think there's like tons of examples where, you know, um, a sociologist, you know, who studies information might have lots of things to say about what are the ways to sort of like combat misinformation? What do we know about this? What's happening elsewhere? That's by the way, oh, actually I should have said that in response to the previous question. The format of like, when I'm saying we're doing research briefs, like sometimes it's basically like, oh, there's this published research out there. We're gonna summarize it for you. A lot of times it's basically just like, what are other places doing? And that was the initial stuff we got at the beginning of COVID, like where, you know, it was basically like, you know, what, how are other places dealing with this childcare crisis? Or how are other places using mobile vans? Like, I remember at the time thinking to myself, because again, like I, I wasn't necessarily a subject matter. So I, I'm doing kind of the outreach side of this, whereas my colleague Elizabeth Day is doing, she's more of the top family policy expert, the subject matter expert. And like, you know, I, I have to, I remember, I'll never forget saying to Elizabeth, I was like, I don't even know what a mobile van is. Like, I kind of, I, I know like what the words mean, but I don't know what it like looks like, like what it, you know. And so anyway, but so um, anyway, but that was sort of like, that was what the nature of it was. And so I can imagine like with the historian saying like, maybe not what's happening, like, you know, um, uh, in other places, but rather what's happened at other points in time. What do we need to know? What 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 didn't work well in the past, and things like that. And so, you know, particularly, I mean, I think about sort of like the you know the pandemic. I mean, I feel like I learned so much from historians who are experts on 1918, um, among other things, of course. But um, so yeah, so no, totally. And I think it's really interesting. And, and um, you know, and I mean. Is it going to work for everybody? No. And again, are all policymakers going to want to talk to historians? No. I mean, I think that's, and, you know, so there's a little bit of a sort of like experimental mindset that has to go in, but that's true of, you know, any op-ed is not going to get read by lots of people. Any social media posts is going to get zero likes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Hi there. Wait, you had a question from before. Two things. So, um, so first of all, I mean, I, I want to sort of, I, I want to just sort of acknowledge like everything you said and say like that is real. And as somebody who is on the, you know, a tenure track faculty member as well, like I, I absolutely get that. And um, yep, right. Which yeah. But at the same time, like, and, you know, does getting grants matter for like, you know, promotion and stuff for me? Kind of, but actually not that much because it's a hard money tenure line. And so it's kind of, um, and so, you know, it's, and, 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 you know, it's, and certainly not peer reviewed like publications, like doing like that work in particular is not necessarily peer reviewed publications. And so, so I think that, you know, so, so I, I want to sort of acknowledge, first of all, that like everything you're saying about sort of incentives and, um, and also sort of like that relationships are sort of not something that just happen like, you know, immediately. I think that's absolutely right. Um, I would say two things. So one, three things. The first thing is to say, if you're not doing anything at four o'clock, you should like come over to our set the next session um, because that session, oh, um, well, I don't know much about that, but um, you, you, um, but like because it is going to actually sort of touch on this. But so the um, but 
in so the second the the second bullet point there the organizational leaders um i think that you know the matchmaking is one way to sort of um uh build relationships like quickly um and i think having a having a third party doing it is like absolutely like you know is it necessarily going to get rid of like every single sort of like concern about sort of like relationality of course not but that's just true in general but it's i think it's one way to sort of short circuit a lot of that stuff so what what research for impact um Oh, oops, I put it up here because I was like, I was pressing the button by accident. Um, what Research for Impact does, we're basically, we're matchmakers. So what we do is we build sort of like collaborative relations. We act as sort of a third party between researchers and mostly researchers and practitioners, now increasingly researchers and policymakers as well. Um, and so, but even that work is, is only over the past year or so, or year and a half. Um, and, um, and so anyway, so that's, um, but, but that's sort of like, but that's basically what we're doing. So we're sort of saying like, you know, that people, we've, it's gotten to the point where enough people sort of come to us and say, basically, I would like you to sort of like initiate a new collaborative relationship for me. Um, it's not happening on its own for some of the kinds of reasons, very legitimate reasons that you mentioned, like 100%. Um, so there's that. On the incentive piece, um, so a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think that, you know, like, could the academy do more to incentivize this stuff? I think absolutely. Um, one of the things, so I, the, um, the SNF Agora part of my title is uh, I'm affiliated with the Agora Institute, which is a Democracy Institute at um, Johns Hopkins. Um, and that the director of the Agora Institute, um, when um, she does the um, uh, uh, when she does like kind of our, our, our semi annual reports to the board and kind of gets distributed widely or whatever, she actually asks us to sort of like report the number of she calls them strategy sessions, but they're basically like informal collaborative relationships um, with um, organizational leaders. Uh, with funders, with non, other kinds of nonprofits, with policymakers, any of that kind of stuff. She asks us to report it and she puts that into the report. And so, you know, now granted, I will say that like the Agora Institute has tenure lines, but not tenure homes. Nobody at the Agora Institute is like, you know, is, is responsible for sort of like judging promotion and tenure of anybody else within the Institute, unless they happen to be in the same home department. So it's not exactly, you know, I think the incentives are still not maybe as strong as they could be to your point. Um, but it is sort of one way of just sort of when I talk about sort of elevating and legitimizing informal collaboration, like I'm very much and people ask me, I get this question a lot, like, you know, okay, how would you do it? I say, well, you know, just put, start telling people about it. Because like, I know that like, at the, so the other thing that's up here, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, you know, every single day, I get an email about all of the ways in which Bloomberg faculty have appeared in the news over the past 24 hours. And that's fine. But like, you know, it's sort of, but this idea about like, okay, well, how many, like, I also happen to know that like at the Bloomberg School, there are tons of faculty, like myself included, who are interacting with foundation leaders, with policymakers, with bureaucrats, with, you know, um, uh, with elected policymakers, with bureaucrats, with, you know, like, like a whole host of people with nonprofit leaders. And, you know, I mean, what would happen if that kind of stuff just got, just like let people know about it more? Because it usually it is very invisible. And it's invisible. I mean, sometimes, yeah, it's top secret. Okay, fine. But, but a lot of times it's not. It's just sort of, it just happens one-on-one -on -one in the privacy of people's offices because that's what happens with the interactive collaborative relationship. It happens, you know, that's the point um, as opposed to sort of disseminating broadly. And so I think that that's at least a step in the right direction. Um, I think there's some other things that are, I could say that are maybe a little bit more sort of like some other ideas of, of kind of what to do. And, uh, but, um, but I think that like, cause I, I, I guess, sorry, the last thing I'll just say on this, I am in lots of rooms oftentimes where people sort of talk about, we need to reform promotion and tenure to kind of, you know, uh, um, value kind of public engagement in general more, but then like, and maybe like this form of it, but, but many forms of it. And I think that's totally fine. And I, you know, would be happy to support that um, or in theory support that. I mean, it kind of depends on what it is, but like, um, but I think that, you know, one of the things I really like about sort of just simply like, you know, asking faculty to keep track of it and publishing it in, in these reports that the director of the SNF Agora Institute does is at least just sort of, it's like, it's, it's easy. It's like an initial step, just sort of changes the conversation. That, oh, this thing is happening. And like, you know, we think it's important enough to put it in there. So anyway. Uh oh, oh my goodness, two minutes. Um, yeah. No, no, no. What's your name? Sorry with the what? With the American National Society. Oh, I, you know, it's, oh cool. Um, I'm definitely not a subject matter and ex expert in that. I will ask you about it. Um, so I'm meeting with representatives um, of the Department of Education, Department of Health, Department of Human Services, Department of Education, Department of Human Services, 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 Department of
Yeah, so that is, um, okay, that is a question that takes longer than two minutes. Um, it does though speak to, but it's really important. I'm, I'm really glad you asked it. Um, so um, the, to me, it speaks to the second, uh, um, well, the second dash thing, which is how should you communicate with policymakers? Um, and I think that what I'm about to say, I would argue applies for pretty much any kind of elected. Um, and, I, and actually, especially for elected. So the, the thing that like researchers worry about um, or it, it often worry about basically sort of, they don't want to be, they're perceived as lobbying. Um, they're often not allowed to lobby. Um, I mean, especially depending on like who's, you know, if you have grants, like, you know, the grants will say you can't lobby, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, our grant money can't be used for lobbying, like all that kind of stuff, like really big restrictions on that. And so the question that often arises is sort of like, you know, and so what I would argue what I think, I mean, you should push back on this, but like, to me, it sounds like what you're gonna be doing is sort of like essentially advocacy. And there's often this question about like, sorry, well, okay, what's, when does it stop being advocacy and when does it start being lobbying? And I think different people, people disagree on this. And I'm guessing Jennifer probably has like a lot to say on this, but like, you know, whether you're, if you're at, there's a difference between informing like people, informing legislators about sort of what does the research say in general and kind of this like kind of meant to be this objective balanced perspective overall. And so this idea of the stuff that like Elizabeth Day and I are doing on like, I mentioned earlier about like mental health and like all in response to your question, you know, um, and mobile vans, stuff like that, that kind of falls into that. Um, versus saying like, you know, you should, you know, support this law. That's kind of usually more of like kind of lobbying. Um, and so, um, or would be perceived as lobbying. So I think that, you know, so like, so steering clear of the lobbying side is one thing. The other thing though, too, so I have been in many, oops, I have been in many rooms where like, you know, basically citizen um, advocates are being trained, like nonprofits are sort of training them and then they're going to go off the Capitol Hill kind of thing. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that like is really interesting to me about those meetings, you have these people who are like super like high socioeconomic status. Like when we think about sort of like anybody who sort of, I don't know if anybody in the room like studies kind of civic engagement or if there's any political science, nobody has revealed themselves as a political scientist, but if there are any political scientists in the room, like, you know, you sort of know that like, you know, people who are high in income and education and like, you know, other kind of, all sorts of other advantages tend to be sort of more active in the political process in various ways. Well, I've been in rooms with like tons of those people who like still don't feel like they know how to communicate with policymakers. And especially, this is the last thing I'll say, I know I'm like over time, but like the last thing I'll say about this is that, and the thing that they don't, and this has been in particular with climate organizations. So they're gonna go have meetings with folks on their representatives on Capitol Hill about climate. And like the idea that it is okay to talk about your own personal concern, like your own personal story about like how climate change is affecting you and things you care about and your family and where you're from and all that kind of stuff, like to legislators or to their staff, you know, um, like the idea that that's okay, that that's a good idea is often news to people. And I think it's, I think that's like super interesting because essentially like what the people in those rooms, the reason why those training sessions exist in the first place is basically because people feel like they don't necessarily know how to relate to staff and to legislators. And I think it's, so I, I so I, I, share, I share this in, in some sense, just to sort of like, I think like normalize that and to legitimize that because like, you know, I didn't take a class in high school. You know, I went to high school in the United States. I did not take a class in high school to ever talk about how would you actually talk to an elected official or their staff member, like not once. And I, you know, I don't know. I mean, um, and so, um, and a couple of people are nodding. So I'm guessing that like, I can't be the only person in the room. And so I think, but that's sort of like, in terms of like how to speak to them, I mean, that those are, you know, that difference between advocacy and, and lobbying is, is really important. I'm sure you probably have, people have talked about that. I think also sort of talking about just kind of like, why do you care about this issue? And, and is I think actually also like really important. And, um, and um, yeah, so anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I will turn this off though. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, um, so, 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 so,